modern world, to bitter success in giving freedom to the emergent masons. For centuries, the world has looked upon Africa as a thief looks upon treasure. It is there to be plundered. Our forefathers were stolen in millions during the slave trade, and our minerals have fed the industries of the West. Our traditional cultures were suppressed, and their artifacts stolen to fill the museums of Europe and America. Our land was occupied by strangers, and our people confined to reserves. Kenya, now an independent African nation, was once meant to become something quite different. Kenya, in other words, was meant to become a white man's country. As the music retained in this album is a humble offering to the unity of the entire black nation. What you're about to hear is not jazz or some other irrelevant term we allow others to use in defining our creation. But the sounds which are about to saturate your being and sensitize your soul is the continuing process of nationalist consciousness manifesting its message within the context of one of our strongest natural resources, black music. We must begin to understand it is our responsibility and duty to be in constant search of stronger and better means of amplifying, radiating, and raising the level of consciousness of our people. And once this process is intensified, identity, purpose, and direction will be the end results as we move to embrace our new value system, defining those things in our lives which affect our lives the way we choose to. Asante Tambo. And to the brothers who appear on this offering, I give my warmest affection and appreciation. Umoja means unity. Unity is the beginning. And as the African proverb says, if you know the beginning well, the end will not trouble you. For Tayadi, Gaidi, Watani, Ali, Tuwala. Tuwala. Asante. This was called the Scramble for Africa. By 1914, only two countries remained outside European possession, Liberia in the west and Ethiopia in the east. Britain had seized the lion's share of control. Egypt and the Sudan in the north, the immense wealth of South Africa, 
valuable colonies like Rhodesia and Kenya, and richly populated territories such as Nigeria and the Gold Coast. France had invaded Algeria in the 1830s. Now, after new wars of conquest, she added more colonies to her empire south of the Sahara, including the island of Madagascar. Little Portugal carved out two vast colonies, Angola and Mozambique, while Imperial Germany took the Cameroons and southwest Africa, and on the east coast, Tanganyika. The vast Congo Basin fell to King Leopold of the Belgians. Italy and Spain completed the enclosure. The fate of the continent was utterly changed. Harithuku, one of Kenya's first political leaders, died of cancer in 1970. He belonged to a generation whose life spans the entire colonial period in East Africa, from the end of the 19th century to the decade of independence in the 1960s. It is a generation which remembers the first white men to settle in Kenya, the first confrontations with colonial rule, and the long struggle for freedom which followed. A few years before this generation was born, the imperial powers of Europe had already determined its destiny. In the 1880s, Britain, Germany, France and others divided Africa into spheres of European influence and set about establishing control over peoples and territories they hardly knew existed. In 1895, Britain declared a protectorate over East Africa about the same time, the generation which mourned Harry Thuku was born. Their lives are the history of colonialism in Africa. Azungwa shomo kire kambiri ya namo imaga na mambazai mo kaga. Maria Maria Guri, Maria India, Abia Shara, Makendia Mirage. The white men first came from the coast as buyers and dealers. They sold blankets, bracelets, beads and calico sheets. And they bought elephant tusks in return. But they were not fighting. They were accompanied by armed guards but fought only if provoked. Their main purpose, really, was trade. In 1890, the Imperial British East Africa Company a private trading company, sent its first expedition through Kenya, led by Captain Frederick Lugard. The treaties and trading centers which Lugard established were the opening gambit in the process of colonization. 10th October, 1890. Waiyaki Wahinga, local chief of Wakikuyu, having made blood brotherhood with Captain Lugard, understands by these formalities that he is the sworn friend and ally of the British, that he will supply them with food, that they are free to settle in his land and will never be molested. The British, on their part, will do him no harm. Lugard went on to Uganda, to the west. The situation behind him deteriorated. In London, the Imperial British East Africa Company found itself in a financial crisis and directed its agents in the field to become self-sufficient. 
the deliberate and wide-scale confiscation of crops and animals began without regard for ownership or human life. By the time Lugard returned to Kenya, two years later, blood brotherhood had been forgotten. 12th August, 1892. Our British policy of bringing peace and prosperity to Africa instead of war seems falling to pieces. The company fighting in Kikuyu and now among the peaceful and friendly Wakamba. Perkis firing on and killing the Maasai and Captain Nelson has hammered the peaceful and harmless Wataita and killed many and hung some on trees. Such is our vaunted peace for Africa. From the letters of Sir Gerald Portal, 3rd February 1893. By refusing to pay for things, by raiding, looting, swashbuckling and shooting natives, the Imperial British East Africa Company has turned the whole country against the white man. Shortly afterwards, Chief Waiyaki was captured in a struggle with some company men. The first in a long line of political prisoners, Waiyaki died mysteriously on his way to exile. Hello. When the traders had been in the country for a few years, their government arrived and began to impose its rule on us. Forts were set up around the countryside at Dagareti, Kiambu, Nyeri and so on. Soldiers were stationed in these forts and were used to control the people. From the private correspondence of Sir Charles Elliot, Commissioner of British East Africa. No doubt on platforms and in reports, we declare we have no intention of depriving natives of their lands. But your Lordship has opened this protectorate to white immigration and colonization. And I think it is well that, in confidential correspondence at least, we should face the undoubted issue. That is, that white meets black in a very few moves. There can be no doubt that the Maasai and many other tribes must go under. From the diaries of Francis Hall, February 1899. We proceeded to march quietly through the country, sending columns out to burn the villages and collect goats. We destroyed a tremendous number of villages and after 14 days we emerged on the plains to the eastward having gone straight from one end to the other of the disaffected districts we captured some 10,000 goats and a few cattle and this on top of the previous expedition must have been a pretty severe blow to them from the diaries of colonel richard minitz hagen king's african rifles 8th September 1902 I have performed a most unpleasant duty today. I made a night march to the village where the white settler had been so brutally murdered the day before yesterday. I gave orders that every living thing except children should be killed without mercy. Every soul was either shot or bayoneted. We burned all the huts and raised the banana plantations to the ground. May 1905, Sotique, 92 killed, 2,000 cattle, 3,000 sheep and goats captured. 14,000 rounds rifle ammunition used, and two Maxim guns. September 1905, Kisi, 100 killed, 
3,000 cattle captured. January 1906, Nandi, 1,100 killed, 16,000 cattle, 36,000 sheep and goats captured. January 1908, Kisi again, 200 killed, 7,000 sheep, 5,000 goats. It looks like a butchery, Winston Churchill said when he heard of the Kisi massacre. And if the House of Commons gets hold of it, all our plans in the East Africa Protectorate will be under a cloud. Surely it cannot be necessary to go on killing these defenseless people on such an enormous scale. For the people of Kenya, the price of the Pax Britannica was high. The slaughter of thousands, the forced resettlement of whole tribes outside their traditional areas, the destruction of tens of thousands of homesteads and villages, and the confiscation of hundreds of thousands of cattle, sheep, and goats. What you are doing now, eh, guy? To what is it? The umbara muchinga, eh? Na itimoi, na angoi, niatia. The government did not come peacefully, but what was a spear to a gun? There was fighting, and people were killed. But Europeans won because they had guns. Had it been a matter of spears and swords, things would have been different. In the first ten years of British involvement in Kenya, more than a third of the colony's budget went into military operations. By 1915, every major tribe had faced at least one so-called punitive expedition. This was the foundation on which 70 years of colonial rule were based. The land of the Kamba and the Boran, of the Luo, the Digo, the Luya and the Taita. The land of the Maasai, the Meru, the Kikuyu and the Tugan. Of the Kisi, the Somali, the Takana and the Teso. The land of the Embu and the Samburu. Of the Nandi and the Kipsigis. Of the Giriyama and the Maraquet. The land of all the peoples of Kenya. I have great hopes that the punishment of the Sutik will bring the Kisi to reason, remarked Commissioner Stewart in 1905. It is most important to open up this part of the protectorate, which is well adapted to European settlement. From a report by Sir Harry Johnston, 1901. Here we have a territory, now that the railway is built, admirably suited for a white man's country. And I can say this with no thought of injustice to any native race. For the country in question is either utterly uninhabited for miles and miles, or at most, its inhabitants are wandering hunters. This will be one source of profit to the United Kingdom. In 1906, a million acres had been given to settlers. A decade later, a thousand European farmers had claimed more than five million acres of fertile countryside, the White Highlands. For the next 50 years, this rich and abundant part of the country ceased to exist for Africans, except as workers on white farms.
In 1901, the Uganda Railway was completed. It had been built in six years with the help of thousands of Indian laborers, many of whom stayed on afterwards. The line ran for nearly 600 miles from the port of Mombasa on the Indian Ocean in the east across the southern part of Kenya to Lake Victoria in the west. Like other railways of the 19th century, it was meant to open up the continent. In fact, it was an economic disaster. The commissioner at the time, Sir Charles Elliot, wrote, It is a curious confession, but I do not know why the Uganda Railway was built. To help make it pay, he began to encourage South Africans and Englishmen to come to Kenya as settlers. In 1909, Theodore Roosevelt came to Kenya on a hunting safari. I believe this country has a great agricultural and industrial future, Roosevelt told the settlers. And meanwhile, it occupies a unique position as the most attractive playground in the world. The frontier is no place for weak and shiftless people, Roosevelt wrote. But the same kind of man who did well when he went to the far west, to the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains 30 years ago, can do well here. The prime need is to build up a large, healthy population of true white settlers, white homemakers who shall take the land as an inheritance for their children's children. Sooner or later, it must lead to a clash between black and white, Colonel Minitz Hagen had written in 1902. I cannot see millions of educated Africans, as there will be in a hundred years' time, submitting tamely to white domination. After all, it is an African country, and they will demand domination. Then blood will be spilled, and I have little doubt about the eventual outcome. On the 4th of September, 1913, the Grant family, Major Jocelyn, his wife Nellie and daughter Elspeth, set sail from Britain for a remote part of the British Empire called Kenya, enticed by the promise of a new life. Win a golden return in Africa. Climate and soil alike work for the settler. Crops of all sorts flourish prolifically. Labor is cheap. The life is healthy and free from home conventions and restrictions. It is the ideal life for the energetic and enterprising. Six weeks later, they arrive at the port of Mombasa. All around them, Kenyan produce, tea and coffee, coconuts and maize was being loaded onto ships to be sent back to Britain. Through its empire, Britain controlled 60% of the world's rubber, 50% of the world's rice, and 70% of the world's gold production. For Britain, the empire provided a ready-made market for their manufactured goods, like trains. The building of a railway from Mombasa to Kisumu brought the inaccessible interior into contact with the outside world. Land flanking the new railway seldom grazed by the nomadic tribesmen and cultivated not at all, was taken over by the white man, populated with cattle and cultivated. From Mombasa, the Grants take the train to the capital, Nairobi, traveling in a first-class carriage, whites only. In Nairobi, 
they find much to make them feel at home. British-style hotels, churches, tea shops and banks. They soon move on to a small settlement called Thika. Here they build a house and establish a plantation to grow coffee. Land in Kenya was plentiful and cheap. Sir Harry Johnston, a colonial administrator, thought that the British were building up Kenya out of nothing. Here we have a territory, admirably suited for a white man's country, for the country in question is utterly uninhabited for miles and miles. Difference? Very little difference. We had our dogs and our horses and our friends and we entertained, we went about. The Africans were very friendly and willing to learn and they worked for one. They'd never worked, of course, before, but they soon learned. We took it for granted that everything was all right. <laughs> to the early settlers, Kenya held the promise of feudal England with a better climate. The country never developed a white working class, and the success of the European dream depended, from the beginning, upon African labor. It is essentially an overseer's country, wrote Lord Cranworth in 1912. Once the oxen are broken, and the native taught, continuous manual labor in the sun is no longer necessary. As the land was taken and crowded native reserves set up and as hut and poll taxes were imposed by the European government, more and more Africans were driven into the colonial economy at the lowest and most menial levels. The government road was just one straight street with a line of trees up the middle of it and shops on each side. There were only two. There was a shop called Emma de Souza and a shop called Nazareth, both owned by Goanese, where Mother went and she bought three tin plates and three tin mugs to start us with. We had a donkey cart, but we couldn't use the donkey because he wouldn't go, so we went in the donkey cart, Mother and I, with, with two boys in the shafts and two boys pushing behind. That's how we used to go to Nairobi and go to the races. before long was a society based, like everything else in the colonial world, on a racial hierarchy. The European at the top, the Indian in the middle, and the African at the bottom. And it persisted almost unchanged for 60 years. Evidence given to the Native Labour Commission, 1912. Supposing a native refuses to turn out to work after having been advised to do so, Mr. Boy states that if he were district commissioner, he would order him to receive 25 lashes for insulting the government and for being insolent. Mr. Boyes takes the attitude that he knows better than they do what is for their benefit. One European is in the habit of harnessing his natives to a plow and when remonstrated with, excuses himself on the ground that it is only a light cultivator. The thing that bound, I think, people together in those days, and I can't emphasize it too vividly for you, was this uh, extraordinary sense we all had that we were creating something. The sense of making a country, placing it under British traditions and ideas, developing it, seeing the roads grow, the railways spread and gradually the land tamed. That was a tremendous uh, bringer together of the Europeans and it gave them what to nowadays we call a sense of mission. In August 1914, a war began in Europe. Within a few weeks, it was raging in East Africa as well. 
Kenya was a British colony. Tanganyika, its neighbor to the south, was German. The battles went on for four years in the only major theater of war outside Europe. In its conduct, the East Africa campaign was simply another dimension of the colonial system. It rested primarily on African heads and shoulders. We were told to join the army because the Germans were invading our country. And if they succeeded, we would suffer. Many of us were arrested and tied together by ropes. We were taken away and loaded into lorries. It is sad to read, wrote a British medical officer, of how great a boon we bestowed by stopping into tribal war. Since then, our own war has destroyed more life than a generation of intertribal wars. British rule has brought peace. The enterprise of European officials and settlers and of Indian traders has opened up the country. But there is still a long battle to be fought with ignorance, poverty and disease. From Kenya alone, the British recruited 160,000 porters, mostly by force. Their casualties were enormous. 42,000 porters died of disease and starvation. Fewer than 400 were actually killed in battle. Well, people felt they were going to create another dominion, like New Zealand. I remember coming out on the boat, the excitement of people. They felt they were making a new country, and that country would be part of the empire. Then they had a tremendous sense of mission. So fashioned today, but they felt that they had a, an imperial mission that was bringing something to Kenya, the British way of life. Africa, home of more primitive peoples, with colonies spread from the Indian Ocean to the South Atlantic. The British taxpayer gives a helping hand to the colonies. In the next few years, 55 million pounds are to be spent on their development and welfare, striking proof that even in the midst of war, Great Britain does not shirk her responsibilities to her colonies. Britain's plans for her colonies can best be understood by seeing how they are applied to the native people in one area of British Africa, Kenya Colony, the mandated territory of Tanganyika, and the protectorate of Uganda. Here in 700,000 square miles, 30,000 Europeans and 80,000 Indians live side by side with 12 million Africans. They are people who live by the soil. Some tribes, such as the Wakamba and the Maasai, herd their cattle on the plains. Others, such as the Luo and the Kikuyu, are tillers of the soil. This simple life under the hot African sky was once a life of fear and uncertainty. Hostile tribes ravaged their neighbors' villages and cattle. The squalor of the villages and the lack of proper food still makes their communities easy victims to the diseases of the tropics. Such are the problems Britain is trying to solve in East Africa. In these lands, where there are so many changes to be made, much can be achieved by money and the initiative of the white man. Today, rivers are harnessed to bring electricity. Harbors and docks, these are at Mombasa, open up trade. Bridges carry the new roads and railways into districts cut off for years from the march of life. A good medical service is essential. The service of hospitals and village dispensaries is being steadily expanded. In Kenya, one in 24 have their babies in these centers, and in the Kiambu district, where this hospital is, the figure is as high as one in five. The tetsi fly infests nearly the whole of tropical Africa. It kills cattle on which many tribes depend for their living. This small fly has closed vast areas to men. Two-thirds of Tanganyika cannot be lived in because of Tetsi. At eight different research stations, scientists are studying its habits and movements and trying to find ways of destroying it. These people are the Ganda, who have been summoned by their chiefs to one of the frequent medical inspections. One of the first signs of sleeping sickness is a swelling of the glands. In doubtful cases, a blood test is taken on the spot. 
Most Africans suffer from malnutrition. Sometimes they don't have enough food. Generally, they lack the right sorts of food. Often, they don't use properly the foods they have. As a result, many of them are not strong enough to resist disease. To all doctors in Africa, nutrition is the basic problem. Here at Engong is a stock farm where natives come to learn how to increase the yield of their cattle. The tribes who own cattle are learning how to prepare hides properly. These Maasai have learned to dry their hides in the shade by stretching them on wooden frames. Better hides fetch better prices. This Maasai chief brings all his cattle to the veterinary officer for anti-rindapest serum. When cattle diseases are controlled, herds increase. The soil is overworked. And a new problem has to be met, the problem of soil erosion. There is no longer any grass to hold the soil together. The rains come and wash away the soil, soil on which the life of every African depends. Sometimes it's washed away in sheets, leaving a flat desert. Sometimes the rainwater cuts deep gullies in the earth, making the land utterly useless. Governments are trying many different ways of stopping erosion and of reclaiming eroded land. Ridges are made which follow the contours of the ground and prevent the earth from being washed away. The natives themselves are learning to make these ridges on their own small holdings. <laughs> All real progress depends on education. Africans are eager for it, so eager that governments cannot keep pace with the demand. The missionaries led the way, and now government schools are becoming increasingly available. We had been led to believe that we were fighting for the defense of our country against foreign invaders. And yet, after the war, we were given medals and a gratuity of a few shillings and nothing else. This meant absolutely nothing to us. But the Europeans, with whom we'd fought side by side, were given our land here. They held a big lottery, bringing soil from all over the country and placing it in envelopes. Then each would-be settler drew an envelope from a kerosene drum. And if it said Molo or Nanyuki or Nakuru, he would go and settle there, wherever the soil came from. <laughs> Back at Sika, the Grant family had to wait five years for their first crop of coffee. Adapting to the unfamiliar conditions of their adopted country wasn't easy, as Nellie Grant recalls. 7th of April. Got back to a terrific locust invasion and a grass fire, and still no signs of the rain. The heat and dust and dryness are foul beyond words. 10th of September. The damned locusts come every day now. Not a sign of rain either. Despite the setbacks, the farm earned the grants up to £25 a month. Not a lot by British standards, but in Kenya at that time, that money went a long way. <laughs> The wealthier British colonists were able to enjoy a standard of living that they would never have had in Britain. Cocktails at the Blue Post's hotel. And parties until the African dawn. And then it was off on safari to shoot the local wildlife. Now, 
na azungu la tuwa na mundu wakahe wei kachiga nona o kulia kulia kwale wako angitu unyo na tuwa kiluwa wanake ngitu unyo ni ya kenengiru my bitterest memory of the war is being given registration certificates while Europeans were given our land. A former army colleague, a European, got the best part of my land and I was forced to carry a registration card. The pain of that treatment still lingers in my stomach. The bitterness still lasts and it is the worst kind of bitterness. Then there was our pay, four shillings a month. Four shillings a month for 30 good days and some maize flour to eat when you've spent the day carrying a heavy load on your head. Those were very bitter times. And we were deceived that we were fighting for our land. But where is that land, even today? These are the reasons that we formed our political party, because of these injustices and exploitations. It was a most bitter thing to be moved from your home, like this one here, told to get out of the way while your house was destroyed by a tractor. As white men I met was a missionary who formed a mission here about two, two miles from my home and his name was called uh, Mr. W.P. Knapp. He was an American mission. That is my first time I met a European before I went to school. I went to the mission. It was an, an American mission here, about two miles from my home here, where we are. So I went to school there and I acquired the knowledge from that School. My grandfather was called Gazirimu, who had very, very large land here. And my father, his name was called Kairianja. The settlers soon found their position challenged by a new generation, baptized as Christians, conversant in the English language, and ready to reclaim the dignity and freedom taken from their fathers by the Maxim gun. In Harithuku, the new generation found a spokesman. My very came in 1915 uh, when we saw many Europeans coming and taking African farms without asking any question or paying in compensation. I was working in government offices afterwards after uh, 1914 war. I was working in treasury, so everybody, even settlers here, around here, well, was known to me very well, they know me very well. We wanted to get our land back first, and if they uh, give us our land back, they would not stay here because they would have nothing to do. The first political party was for the whole of the African population and it was called the East African Association. It was led by Harry Thuku. Harry Thuku was the first political party. Now, Suku obtained the address of the colonial office in England and sent a telegram there, setting forth our grievances. When the government here learnt of this, they were very agitated. The settlers said they would not compromise, and they demanded that Thuku be arrested.
I was arrested on 14th March 1922. I was taken to police line, government road. And after that, the Africans start assembling there, asking for my release. No Africans in Nairobi were working those two days. We had pickets out to make sure people did not break the strike. Mary Muthoni Nyanjiru leapt to her feet, pulled her dress right up over her shoulders, and shouted to the men, you take my dress and give me your trousers. You men are cowards. What are you waiting for? Our leader is in there. Let's get him. Mary and the others pushed on until the bayonets of the rifles were pricking at their throats. And then the firing started. Mary was one of the first to die. On the other side of the lines, the European settlers sitting drinking on the veranda of the Norfolk Hotel joined in the shooting. And it is said they were responsible for most of the deaths over there. The East African Standard, 18th March 1922. The government can rest assured that it has the unquestioning support of the entire European population in any steps it may take to maintain law and order and that every white man and every white woman are at the government's call to this end. The position is now considered to be completely under control and no further outbreak is anticipated. By the 1930s, the Grants were able to afford a new bungalow and employ servants. The Grants liked and treated their servants well. Nelly's photograph of Karanga and Mabagwa has the air of a family snapshot. Life in the Empire could be rewarding, if you were white. Do you know who Harry Thuku was? He was the first politician we had in Kenya. He was a great man and he was a big farmer. And he fought for Uhuru freedom. He was a great man, he was a great leader, a hero. Harry Thuku? Yes. Uh, I think he was a freedom fighter. For 30 years after Harry Thuku's arrest, the struggle continued. New parties and new leaders emerged, but their petitions and delegations to Britain, their protests and strikes in Kenya did not produce results. The only alternative was to take up arms, but it was nothing more nor less than a war of national liberation. <laughs> 